Look, look! See that fine, distinguished elderly gentleman in the white telly hat? Yes, that's me riding on my tastefully pimped mobility scooter. It's a three-wheeler. Apart from our small runabout car seen here, I've been needing this scooter to get me around since my old legs have started to seize up after recovering from the lumpy blood in my lungs last year. They called it a double pulmonary episode, but I'm not totally finished yet. In fact, I've recently acquired some exciting new wheels. However, that's getting ahead of my story. It's strange how sudden change can hit oneself, and things like mobility have to be reassessed. From my own early years, wheels have played a major part in getting around. Whether it was being confronted with one of life's temporary steep hills, or an irreversible situation, changing gear became necessary. I can even remember my mum selling my pram. I was about two years old and quite upset. Shortly after that, we were bombed out of our small home and moved to a new town. Here, with World War II still raging, my parents bought me a fine little ride-on toy horse which had caster wheels. Then, after the war's end, I had a pair of roller skates. Much fun was had by sitting on a short plank balanced across one of the skates and rolling down the bumpy pavement. The terrific noise generated from the old steel wheels clacking against the joints of the stone slabs was just like a roaring tram. Very soon the small wheels broke up, no doubt much to the relief of our neighbours. My father, who was a great innovator, made me a very nice scooter, but the great joy came a few years later when I was given a brand new Hercules bike. What a wonderful Christmas present. I remember its ice crisp chrome handlebars and wheel spokes that sparkled in the winter sunlight. A few pedalling years on, I'd started to become quite practical, and I converted the bike to racy drop handlebars and caliper brakes. Those handlebars were eventually turned upside down, and my steed became a rough rider on which to chase other 14-year-old lads through our tumbling woodland adventure ground. Throughout those early years, of course, my friends and I were building our own contraptions, using any materials that came to hand. Old pram wheels were a precious commodity. For a very short while, I owned a classic racing bike, but I was getting to an age when pedals were not enough. Presented with a sudden opportunity, for two pounds, I bought an old 600cc Douglas motorbike. This machine I stripped down and painted in a very go-fast red and white scheme. With no synchro mesh gearbox, left hand clutch, right hand throttle and right hand gear lever, double declutching to drop a gear proved to be a tricky and noisy event. <laughs> Left hand, declutch whilst right hand closes throttle. Right hand, shift gear lever to neutral. Left hand, let out clutch. Right hand, rev up the engine. Left hand, declutch. Right hand, shift gear lever to lower gear. Left hand, let out clutch. And right hand, resume throttle control. I never did get the hang of it. The bike lasted a couple of months until its crankshaft broke in two. I dismantled it and threw it away. I shudder to think what it would be worth today. Soon the old motorbike was replaced with another worn out beast. I was getting quite adept at quick running repairs, mostly in the basement of our Victorian home, but I do recall out of sight of my official examiner, 
having to make some speedy clutch adjustments in the middle of my driving test. I'm pleased to say I passed. I was 20 when, from a friend, I bought my first car. It was a little French job with its engine in the back. David had done a wonderful makeover, fitting it with fake leopard skin seat covers, a red carpet and a respray of special white paint. This is why I called it my Renault Dulux. The small amount of tinkering required with that first car didn't really prepare me for the demands of my second. I got to thoroughly know every aspect of a 1936 Austin 7, for that is what it really was. Someone had given it an expensive outer body, seats, steering wheel and hood. It looked wonderful, but with my foot hard down on the throttle pedal, I had to pretend I was only in slow cruise mode. Those brakes were so inefficient that I actually shunted another car going slowly uphill. Everything on that car broke down and things like cylinder head removal and reseating were undertaken at campsites when on holiday. Engine, gearbox, steering, transmission, suspension, rear axle, differential. I got to know them all. In the end, I was quite pleased to see some enthusiastic youngsters drive it away for a giveaway price. Loaded with spare parts, it lurched around the corner at the end of our street. And that was the last I saw of it. I was now becoming a responsible adult and immersed in the costly task of renovating my new cottage home. Cars had to make way for less expensive transport, so I was back to two wheels. I had the dilemma of daily commuting five miles to catch a Solent ferry to get to work. It was January, and I acquired an old rally moped. Again, each evening, I had the entertainment of cleaning and adjusting the magneto flywheel to be sure that the small engine would start the following morning. Ah, those early privations. Then it was spring and life became a little easier. For a while I had two nearly identical Lambrettas. Both were in the final phase of their useful lives and in order to commute I had to alternate between them. I'd painted them to match one another, and I was suspected by some people of changing number plates to suit. Would I really do such a thing? Eventually, one of these was written off in a collision with the Morris Minor, and the other just gave up. By then, I'd changed my job and was working for a local firm. The boss, inspired by his hero Henry Ford, decided that just about everyone in Britain wanted a moped. So he designed and went to full-scale production of Scamp the Moped for Everybody. Sadly, the timing was unfortunate. That, together with the strange policy of setting the purchase price for the Scamp, at 39 and three quarter guineas, no doubt thinking that no one would note if the cost was over 40 quid, caused a solemn period of fiscal depression. The scamp scarpered into the realms of it seemed a good idea at the time. I'm pleased to say that the firm recovered and still flourishes. During my time there, it provided me with invaluable experience and set me once more on the highway of car ownership. Since then, I've had an assortment of vehicles bringing me to my current somewhat invalid situation. So, just what sort of conveyance have I now acquired? 